Hello, I'm Alec Avdokai, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. I would first like to apologize that when I first published my last episode, it did not have a conclusion. This is an embarrassing mistake that I have now rectified, and when you listen to the podcast now, it should be updated. Thank you all for understanding. Secondly, I would like to thank you all for your support on how quickly you guys have helped make this podcast of mine grow to extraordinary heights. I never would have thought I could get the number of downloads that I've gotten already, which is 390 as I'm speaking to you. And finally, I must bring up that on Patreon, I'm creating content that no one has yet listened to, and it relates to this very podcast. The lowest tier is $3 a month, and in my opinion, is worth it. My goal is to get $9 a month so I can continue on after I have produced five hours of content. This is coming up very soon, and I have less than an hour left. Do not forget to leave a rating if you're on Apple Podcasts, and leave a comment if you're listening from Podbean. I want to hear from you folks. Thank you so much for your support, and now let's get on to the show. Last time I left off, I talked about the inner politics of the reign of Frederick Wilhelm. I talked about the positive reforms that he made that caused the lives of the average Prussian to improve. We talked about how he wanted to weaken the nobility and political power, at least in principle, was given to people based on merit rather than social rank. We also discussed the horrible court of the Tabax Collegium and the demise of Jakob Paul von Grundling. Also, I guess I forgot to tell you why Frederick Wilhelm's court was called the Tobacco Ministry. This is because the court was notorious for smoking with those foot-long 1700s pipes. They drank and smoked a ton, and the place reeked of tobacco smoke. Since the court was like an organ of government, it was henceforth called the Tobacco Ministry. So yeah, that's why it was called the Tobacco Ministry. And now to start talking about the man you've been waiting for. It's been 10 episodes, and I bet you're finally ready for me to begin talking about him. Are you ready? da da ra Frederick the Great. We are going to be talking about his childhood and horrible treatment he received from his father. So, Frederick the Great was born on January 24th, 1712, on a blistery, cold day in Berlin, the capital of Prussia. Man, it feels so weird to be talking about him as a little newborn baby. Imagine a chubby little baby with cute cheeks just crying through the night. This is Frederick the Great. Now, Frederick the Great was not the firstborn son. There were two sons that died in infancy before he was born. He also had two older sisters, and their names were Wilhelmina and Elizabeth Christine. Wilhelmina, throughout Frederick's life, would be his favorite family member and true companion. So... We've already established how Frederick Wilhelm was a monster to the people at his court. Well, it was the same for his family, too. He was an absolutist in everything. His word and will were iron. It also didn't help that Frederick Wilhelm probably had gout and porphyria. Gout is a form of arthritis that occurs in your feet. and That is caused either by poor diet that is high in uric acid or genetics. While porphyria, according to the Mayo Clinic, is a group of disorders that result from a buildup of natural chemicals that produce porphyrin in your body. Porphyrins are essential for the function of hemoglobin, a protein in your red blood cells that links to porphyrin, binds iron, and carries oxygen to your organs and tissues. 
high levels of porphyrins can cause significant problems. The symptoms of both of these are intense pain. Gout, as described by someone I know, feels like a red-hot knife is stabbing your foot. So yeah, painful stuff that just increased Frederick Wilhelm's rage. Frederick Wilhelm wanted his heir to be someone that only focused on practical matters and basically be the exact same person he is. What, did you think that literature, art, and music can be important? That's a beating for you. So that's what Frederick Wilhelm did to Frederick. Frederick Wilhelm wanted someone who was totally devoted to the military, loved hunting, was completely honest, and had disdain for the arts. Instead, Frederick, as the crown prince, woke up late, hated his duties in the military, hated hunting, was poor at horse riding, and had an eye for high, mainly French, culture. All of these differences made Frederick Wilhelm royally pissed Ah, see what I did there? And this led to further humiliation and abuse that was put onto Frederick the child. So, how was Frederick raised as a little kid? From the time Frederick was born until he was seven, Frederick was put in his mother's, Sophia Dorotea, care, where there was a lot of drama and intrigue from the courtiers and nobody could trust anybody. This shared experience of misery helped forge the relationship between Frederick and his sister, Wilhelmina. This was the part of the childhood that both Frederick and Wilhelmina began to share their love of dogs. Dogs will be a huge presence throughout Frederick the Great's life, specifically greyhounds. By the time Frederick was seven, he also began to learn music, and he had a particularly affinity with the flute. So you can imagine Frederick Wilhelm's horror because that has, doesn't have to do with military obsession. I mean, the, playing the flute isn't practical for a future leader of Prussia. Once Frederick was old enough, and by that I mean seven, he would get a great Prussian education. Here's what David Frazier's book has to say about Frederick's education. Thereafter, for much of the year, he was sent, as a child, to the lonely castle of Wirsterhausen, a few miles south of Berlin, with two senior officers, the 65-year-old General Fink von Finkenstein and the younger Swedish Colonel Kalkstein, as guardians, discharging the strict and unimaginative orders of the king in a routine confined to prayer, Bible study, physical exercise, formal lessons in German, and eating within an exactly prescribed timetable drafted by Frederick Wilhelm. Despite these strict conditions, Frederick managed to get a much more well-rounded education than his father had intended. He learned French with a passion and zeal that he did not, nor would he ever have, for German. Frederick not only spoke French, but he breathed in the culture, and even thought French rather than German. The literature and science books that he read were French, and he wrote almost entirely in French. This ties into why I did an episode on Louis XIV. Without that particular monarch exploding French culture onto the European stage, then French would not be the culture language of culture, or the lingua franca of the courts of Europe, and therefore Frederick's first language would not have been French. This was not just a goofy effort to try to stretch out this series, it was a genuine attempt to give you the most in-depth context that I could in this utterly confusing time in history. Anyway, this was the way that Frederick grew up. He had extremely harsh military discipline while also learning forbidden knowledge of culture on the side. But just to let you know, Frederick Wilhelm constantly humiliated him in public or physically beat him. This was just normal life for Frederick as a child. 
expected to be the mirror image and a great soldier prince just like his father, but failing to do so in nearly every aspect. With Frederick Wilhelm even remarking, I would like to know what is going on in his little head. I know for sure he does not think as I do, when Frederick was just 12 years old. However, you could see the beginning of his personality being shaped as he aged. There was one instance when Frederick was supposed to be at this military review, and Frederick Wilhelm would personally inspect the troops, you know, because of his obsession. However, Frederick woke up late, and therefore arrived late at the review. Frederick Wilhelm, all pissed off and with a great grimace on his face, asked Frederick why he was late again. Frederick said that he needed to pray after he was dressed. The king said that he could just as well pray while he was getting dressed so he wouldn't be so late. Frederick retorted back, and I'd like to imagine a sly fox look on his face with this part. Frederick said, and I quote, His Majesty will surely allow that one cannot pray properly if one is not allowed alone, and that one must set his time specifically for praying. In such matters, one must obey God rather than men. However, Frederick Wilhelm only responded to this by further clamping down. According to the book, The Iron Kingdom by Christopher Clark, Frederick Wilhelm's solution was to step up the pressure on the crown prince by subjecting him to a grueling routine of daily chores, military reviews, inspection tours, council meetings, all timetable to the very last minute. In a letter written when Frederick was in his 14th year, Imperial Ambassador Count Friedrich Heinrich von Seckendorf observed that the Crown Prince, despite his young years, looks as elderly and stiff as if he'd served on many campaigns. Also, a bit of vocabulary time. This quote twice refers to Frederick as the Crown Prince. This simply means that he is heir to the throne. Think of the Prince of Wales in the UK, or Simba at the beginning of Lion King when he's singing just can't wait to be king. Also, I always thought that that song is really weird. How do crown princes become kings? Their dad dies. Simba apparently just can't wait for that to happen, I guess. Sorry, it just got on my nerve. Anyway, the title of crown prince in Europe means that you are next in line to be king. And in German, the title of crown prince is called Kronprinz. So, anyway, to get back to the main story of Frederick the Great's childhood, this powder keg of tension between Frederick and Frederick Wilhelm would continue throughout his developmental years. Also, I would feel pretty bad if I left this story out. So, Frederick was 16 years old when he and his father went on a state visit to Dresden, the capital of the electorate of Saxony, when he was which was led by Augustus the Strong. You remember Augustus the Strong, right? The king of Poland who got his butt kicked by Charles XII of Sweden in the Great Northern War? Yeah, well, he was also the ruler of Saxony. Anyway, so as Frederick the adolescent walks into the Saxon court, he is absolutely blown away by the beauty and the liveliness of it all. All Frederick had known of beauty were the books he had read and the music he heard. He now could see visual beauty in the court of Saxony. Also, Saxony, if, if you look at, at um, if you look on it on a map, borders Prussia and is just south of them. Anyway, Frederick had never known such joy in seeing such a spectacle, and then something scandalous happened. Augustus the Strong's mistress had caught the eye of Frederick. Her name was Countess Orzelska. And buckle up, because we're going to go from 0 to 60 real quick. Because Orzelska was also, according to David Fraser's book about Frederick the Great, and I quote, was also Augustus's illegitimate daughter. Orzelska's son became the 
Prince of Holstein, both son and grandson of Augustus. Orzelska, daughter of Augustus, by a French milliner in Warsaw, had been introduced to his immediate circle by her lover, another son of Augustus, and thus her half-brother. Even if none of this is true, this is one heck of a story that I just don't know how to respond to with the levels of my disgust. This better be true, David Frazier. However, this would not be the last time that Frederick would have a fling with a girl. Frederick Wilhelm heard rumors of his son and the daughter of a music teacher and had her publicly whipped through the streets, including inside her father's own house. She was then sent as to a life of hard labor at the fortress of Spandau. After Frederick Wilhelm had died, Frederick the Great ended up pardon pardoning her and paying her a pension for her troubles. However, I'm going to say this once, and I'm most likely going to repeat this. Frederick, for the majority of his life, preferred men. This does not make him a homosexual in the modern sense, because that term had not existed by that point in history. But nonetheless, he preferred men. There is even a quote attributed to Frederick the Great after he lost a battle. Frederick said, Fortune has it in for me. She is a woman, and I am not that way inclined. There is going to be a special episode about Frederick the Great and his sexuality further down the line. However, there is a YouTube video done by Emperor Tiger Star that gives a great 20-minute breakdown of Frederick's sexuality if you want to watch a video about it right now. So, we once again go back to Frederick Wilhelm's reaction to all of this. He is the stereotype of what a bad dad to a gay man is. Someone who is so masculine that he refuses any other viewpoint than his own. Frederick Wilhelm appointed a new tutor named Lieutenant Colonel von Rachel to keep him from effeminate, lascivious, or feminine operations. So basically, Frederick is banned from doing anything that he likes to do and must be fully immersed into the army. Here's a perfect description from the book The Iron Kingdom of what Frederick's life is like in adolescence. By the time he was 16 in 1728, the prince was leading a double life. He conformed outwardly to the hard regime imposed by his father and fulfilled his duties, adopting a cold and penetrable countenance whenever he was not among intimates. In secret, he began playing the flute, composing verse, and accumulating debts. Through the good offices of his Huguenot instructor, Duhan, he acquired a library of works in French reflecting a secular, enlightened, philosophical literary taste that was the diametrical antipode of his father's world. Sensing that his son was drifting away from him, Frederick Wilhelm became increasingly violent. He frequently slapped, cuffed, and humiliated the prince in public. After one particularly savage beating, he is reported to have shouted at the crown prince that he would have shot himself if his father had mistreated him thus. Wow. Now that is true abuse coming from his father. To wrap up today, I will finish with a quote about what Frederick looked like at this stage of life. Here is a quote from David Fraser's book. To all but his father, Frederick was an attractive youth of middle height. He stood five foot five inches with the most intelligent face, brilliant dark blue eyes, a musical voice on which everyone commented throughout his life, an exceptionally smart, sharp mind, and a ready wit. This is what Crown Prince Frederick looked as an adolescent. I believe with that mental picture, I shall have to end this week's episode. We discuss the birth and childhood of Frederick the Great and his ever-constant harsh treatment from his father, the king, and how Frederick had to jump through so many hoops 
just to exercise his passions. Just as a heads up, I will be going on a hiatus after the next two episodes because I have my studies that I need to think about once I go back to college. But I will be a, I will be back, so do not worry. So the way I conclude the last three times will be au revoir until we meet again. <laughs>